Good morning. What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. I hope you all came to worship the Lord today. Amen. I want you to stand with me, please. We want to give him praise and glory. This is his place, his time, and his presence, and we just glorify him for all that he is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want to, I want to open with the scripture, Psalm 68 and 19. Psalm 68, 19, and it says, Praise the Lord, praise God our Savior, for each day he carries us in his arms. How many know he's carrying you in his arms right now? There's days that we feel like we can't even get up out of bed or can't even do anything, but we know that his hand is always there. He is, his arms are around us, giving us protection and loving and caring on us. Amen. Father, I just want to thank you for your beautiful presence. Lord, I just want to thank you that your arms are around us, that you're carrying us, that you're taking care of us, Lord. I'm asking now that you would just touch this place with your presence. Holy Spirit, have your way in each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to make sure that our minds are focused on you and not on everything else around us. Lord, that we would give you all the glory and all the honor, Lord, in everything. I ask you to touch your word, Lord, today. Lord, let it be something special to us, as it always is. But, Lord, let it touch us deeply today. And let us take this and use it in our daily lives. And we glorify your name, Lord, for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I do want the Lord to abide with me and everywhere I go and everything I do. Hallelujah. I just love him. I love him. Sometimes we, we like to just say, I love you, Lord, but we need to make, make sure that in our hearts we are truly loving him because he's wonderful, he's glorious, and one day we will have an eternal home with him. I have a home, eternal home, but for now I walk this broken world. You walked it first, you know our pain, but you show hope with rise again up from the grave. Abide with me, oh abide with me, don't let me fall and don't let go, walk with me. Oh, Lord, never leave, ever close, God, abide with me. There in the night, Gethsemane, before the cross, before the nails. I'm overwhelmed, alone you prayed, you met us in our suffering and bore our shame. Abide with me, oh yes Lord, abide with me, don't let me fall. And don't let go abide. Oh, yes, Lord, just walk with us. Don't ever leave us or forsake us. Because ever close, God, abide with me. That will not ever let me go. It's a love that will not ever let me go. You never let me go. A love that will not ever let me go. And up ahead, Eternity will weep no more and sing for joy. Abide with me, 
Weep no more and sing for joy. Abide with me. Oh, abide with me. Abide with me. Don't let me fall. And don't let go. Walk with me. And never leave. Ever close. God abide with me. It's a love that will not ever let me go. A love that will not ever let me go. Oh Lord, yes, you never, you never let me go. A love that will not ever, oh, come on, sing of that love. A love that will not ever let me go. Love that will not, yes, Lord, your love is forever. Oh, yes, don't let us go. You never let me go. A love that will not ever, no, Lord, never let us go. Oh, Lord, that's what we want. We want to abide in your presence and your love forever. Daily as we walk, let me make sure, Lord, that our heart is full for you, complete for you. And everything that we do, we give you glory. And we live in your love. Lord, let never let us go. Never let us go, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We just worship you, Lord. We worship you. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Do you know that you're free today? That Jesus has set you free? That in him, that's where our true freedom is? It doesn't matter what this world is trying to tell us who we are, that we'll never change and we'll never be accepted. God accepts us. When we give our heart to him, he just takes us in and he loves on us and he gives us freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from a life that used to be because it's in the past. He gives us a brand new life. Hallelujah. Oh, I look to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace, oh, it runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died, oh yes, yes, he died for me. The sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Cause I'm a child, oh, I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my father's house, oh, is a place, a place for me. Because I'm a child, oh, yes. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. And I am who you say I am. Oh, I'm chosen, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are 
are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the Son? Oh, yes, we are free yeah, indeed. Because I'm a child. Oh, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house was oh, a place, a place for me, because I'm a child, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Oh, we are children of God. He's our Father. He's our everything. And He's prepared a place for us. That someday when he comes back, he's going to take us with him forever to be with him. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, yes, we are free indeed. I'm a child. Oh, yes, I am. In my Father's house is a place, oh, a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for preparing a place, for giving us the freedom to live for you. A holy life, pleasing unto you, Lord. We glorify you today, your great name. It's by that beautiful, precious name of Jesus that we're saved. That we're given freedom from what this world has in its bondage. And Lord, we just glorify you today. Hallelujah. We have no fear. Because he's our Lord. Hallelujah. Lost are saved. They find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned feel no shame. At the sound of your great name, every fear, oh, it has no place. Yes, Lord, at the sound of your great name, the enemy, oh, he has to leave at the sound of your great name Jesus worthy is the lamb that was slain for us the son of God and man you are high and lifted up and all the world will praise your great name oh we praise you Lord we glorify you that our praise be sweet unto you, Lord. All the weak, they find their strength at the sound of your great name. Hungry souls, they receive grace at the sound of your great name. Fatherless, oh, they find their rest 
had the sound of your great name. The sick are healed. Oh, and the dead are raised at the sound of your great name. Jesus, oh, he's worthy is the lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, oh, you are high and lifted up, that all the world will praise your great name, your great name. Redeemer, my healer, you're almighty. My Savior, Defender, you are my King, Redeemer, my Healer, oh, you are Almighty, my Savior. Oh, I want to sing that again, you are Redeemer, my Healer, oh, He is Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you you are my King, Redeemer, my Healer. You're Almighty. You're my Savior, Defender. You are my King, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. Oh, He paid it all for us. The Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, oh, you are high and lifted up, oh, and all the world will praise Oh, we praise your name, your great name, oh, your great name. Oh, hallelujah, we just praise you, Lord. We glorify you in this place. You're worthy, worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My beautiful name, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. When you don't even know what to say, that's all you need to say is Jesus. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your mind. He knows what's going on with your life. And if there's a situation that you're wondering about and wondering how is it going to be taken care of? Just call on his name, Jesus. Because sometimes we don't even know what to say. We're, we're sitting there trying to figure out how, Lord, am I going to tell you how I'm feeling? And we may attempt to do that, but sometimes it doesn't always come out like we want it to come out. But you can say the beautiful name Jesus, and he can make it come out all right. He's the one that can do it all for you. Whether it's sickness, whether it's deliverance, whether it's you need freedom from something, whatever it is, whatever it is, at that sound of that great name, Jesus. The mountains can be moved. The obstacles in your way can be gone. All you have to do is look to him and call on him. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I want everybody to just call on him right now. I just want you to tell him how much you love him and just call on him. Say, Jesus, this is your place. Jesus, I am your child. You know the situation, and I need your touch right now, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we love you. We love you. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
You know, sometimes, as this song was just saying, sometimes you're just feeling weak and you need some strength. Just call on his name. Praise his name and see what strength comes to you. See how the Holy Spirit moves in your life just from you calling on his name. Oh, hallelujah. That's what we need. We need, a, we need the Lord to touch us in this place. We lift you up, Lord. We lift you up. And we glorify you with all that we are. Let every breath praise the Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We do worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. I do have a few announcements to make. First of all is our harvest prayer time. Wednesdays at 9.30. If you're able to make it, I please come out and be with us. It is a great time for us to be together praying to our Lord on behalf of all the needs that we have. And if you see our list, we've got quite a few. But not just our needs, the needs of this community, the needs of our nation, because we all know that this nation needs Christ. Amen. More than anything else, they need Christ. Christ. Hallelujah. I also want to remind you of our fellowship lunch right directly after service. Uh, we are going to be having a, uh, hopefully, a, I, well, I can tell you the food's going to be good. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have some good spaghetti, and some people have already asked me, are we having garlic bread? And I said, I don't make spaghetti without garlic bread. I have to have garlic bread with it. So yes, and we have desserts, and we're just going to have a great time of being able to sit around and talk to each other and, and fellowship one with another. I also want to make an announcement. Everybody knows what's been going on in Hawaii, correct? All the devastation with the fires and then the hurricane and just everything else. Um, you know, I, I came to you a couple of weeks ago about giving in our, uh, for a trip that Bernice and I have been asked to go on as missionaries there uh, to preach and to reach other people of, those, of a different culture, but also some of the things that we're trying to raise money to help in that situation. Uh, I told you that we have 21 churches there. Well, now we only have 20 church buildings because in those fires, one of our churches was burned down. Um, and also the pastor's house was burned down. And some of the congregation's houses were burned down also. So in that, our bishop has sent out a wide email to all of the ministers asking if each church could take up an offering. So for the next two weeks, we are going to take up an offering specific to helping and assisting and the supplies that is needed in Hawaii. Because the issue is, is that to get it from here to Hawaii can take two weeks or more. So they are trying to get money over to them to, to buy it off of the big island so they, or one of the other islands so they can send water and food and clothing and just help to all of those because many people lost everything. Now, this is separate from our mission, and I'm asking for us also to continue to give towards that mission. That's going to be in November. We want to be able to take $5,000 with us, and we're combining it because they're wanting to build a ministry and help with some of the churches that are in need uh, and just raising up more ministers for the kingdom of God. Amen? But today, I would ask if you would please, for the next two weeks, to give something special to help with this tragedy that's happened in Hawaii. I want, the, I want you to ask the Lord to, to touch your heart and see what can be given because we want to make sure we can do whatever we can to help those. Isn't that what we're here for? As children of God, they are our family just like each and every one of us. We're all part of the family of God. 
and they are in need of help. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it's offering time this morning. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible tells us, as we get into offering, and you know, that's what Pastor was doing. He was telling us, therefore, encourage one another. Amen. Build each other up. Build each other up, just as, in fact, Pastor did a moment ago, and we normally do at this church, encourage. Our duty is to encourage each other every day and all the time. Amen? When we think of worship, our minds often turn to music and songs uh, that we sing together on Sunday mornings. Yet there is much more to worship than the music. Two of the most important elements of worship, in fact, are in our praise and in our giving. When we give back to God, we are expressing our trust in him and in his provision. When we pray over our offerings to God, we are making him, we are asking him to bless that which we give and use it for his purposes. Amen. So today as we give, let us remember missions, and I know Pastor already spoke much about that, but I just want to reiterate again our faith promise 365, which concludes this month, and in 12 months has allowed our church harvest to raise $10,000. To God be the glory. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And as Pastor has mentioned, the impending Hawaii missions trip for November of this year, and the goal of Harvest Church for $5,000. So now, you might ask, $5,000 again, Pastor? Now somebody say, Amen. We can do it, Amen? <laughs> amen, <laughs> praise God. The Bible says only believe, right? Only believe. And by faith, all things are possible to them that believe. Never doubt God, what God can do. And... Uh, as we heard this past week, we received the heart-wrenching news uh, concerning the wildfires in Maui and the devastation that it left behind. And as was mentioned, many of our Church of God families have suffered total loss. One congregation lost their facility. And um, Pastor mentioned one, but I read from what the overseer said, it was two pastors that have lost their homes so please remember these special needs that we have in our church this morning. Amen? Hallelujah. Just one note for the records of bookkeeping. And, uh, you know, for a while now I've been noticing that sometimes we may receive an envelope that does not have a name on it. It has an amount, but it doesn't have a name. Now, for the purposes of good record keeping, it would be nice if you can write your name and if you don't want to write your name, just mark anonymous. It comes the same as if you don't write a name but, or write anything. But if you can put anonymous, put your name and the amount that you're putting, it will help us go a long way in doing what we want to do with our proper record bookkeeping. Amen? Hallelujah. Let us pray at this time. Thank you, Jesus. Dear God, you have blessed us. You have blessed us with such love and goodness. We wonder at the beauty of your creation, and we thank you for the sustenance of food. We thank you for drink, dear God, and we cherish the love of family and friends. Uh, Lord, we offer these gifts to you with thankful hearts and in joyous praise. As we give of our money and our resources, we surrender our whole beings to you in worship and in adoration. Lord, may this offering extend the work of your kingdom for your church, your community, and into the beautiful world which you have made. As we are about to hear from your word this morning, dear God, let your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our part. We pray, God, that you will touch our pastor as he speaks and as he brings forth your word. 
May your anointing, God, and your spirit, your Holy Spirit, lead him, Lord, in what he's about to say. Bless the suffering again, dear Father, we pray. pray. Bless the hands, Lord, that gave. Uh, and Lord, we pray your blessings upon it. In the name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen and amen. Come and give. Hallelujah. Amen. Standing on the promises of God. And she didn't know that I'm going to be preaching today on living on God's promises. Thank you, Lord. Would everybody stand with me, please? I do want to welcome back Sister Wanda. It is, yes, it's great to see you with us. You've always been and continually be in our hearts, but we're glad to see you face to face today. I'm also glad to see the Stern family with us today. Um, I know the children left to go to children's church, but we are so glad to see you back. Amen. Joshua, the first chapter. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 9. Joshua, the first chapter, starting at verse 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the, from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the way to the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate it on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word. Wonderful word. Now we thank you also, Lord, for the beautiful presence where we are right now. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to make your word alive in our hearts right now. Let us see how we can truly live in the promises of God, that we can walk daily in your word and in your will, and we thank you for all that you're going to do in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Promise, a word 
that even ha- that to me is full of hope. Don't you just love a promise? Especially when you know that the promise maker is also a promise keeper. You know, years ago, a, a good man named Phil Herrick told a pastor and his family, he said, I'm going to send you and your family to Disney World in Florida. Now, at the time, the pastor didn't know this gentleman very well. So he was, he was just kind of a little bit leery of somebody making such a big promise. But several months later, he surprised the pastor one Sunday morning as he got up to make an announcement And the pastor thinking it was going to be on a church function when it was actually him launching pastor appreciation, which culminated in sending the pastor's family on a beautiful Florida vacation while their kids were still young. Promise made, promise kept. See, God has promised each and every one of us a life that's filled with his presence and with his peace. As long as we are living for him, that's what we can look forward to. A life that overcomes the shadows of sin and death. And it's through the brilliant light of Jesus Christ. You know, I spoke last week about the light of the Lord shining through us. Well, it is through that that we get our life filled with his beautiful peace. See, God has a promise for our life. He said, I would make it abundant that we would be marked by the freedom that we have from this sinful world. But it's not just a life for the present and right now. It is also a gift of eternal life when this earthly journey is over. The question is, how do we possess that promised life? Now, some people will be quick to tell you, just receive it by faith. That's what you got to do. And that is true. You do need to receive it by faith. But is there not a responsibility for us to also do some things? It's both yes and no. First of all, if we're talking about responsibility and we're implying that somehow we can save ourselves from sin with some religious effort by being very, very good, I'm sorry, but we're wrong. We cannot in ourselves save ourselves. That is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's the only one. By his name is the only way way that we are saved. But this promised new life that's the work of Christ in us is fully provided at his expense. It's the result of the grace and the love of our Father. Now, we cannot, though, ignore the Bible's commands. It tells us to take possession of this new life. We need to choose on a daily basis to live in a way that opens our lives up to the flow of the Holy Spirit. That means we're living a holy life every single day. Paul says to continue your work through out, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to his will and to act according to his good purpose. The New Living Translation urges us to be careful to put into action God's saving work in our lives. That means we don't just say, okay, I accept you, Christ, and then I'm going to sit down and not do anything else for you. Mm -mm. It means that we need to be obeying God with deep reverence and fear. We need to be living our life for him daily, holy. So how do we possess these beautiful promises of God? Well, in this book, what I just read, part of the scripture of Joshua, gives us some lessons on how to be able to do this. In this story, we see Joshua, his leadership in moving the Israelite people from wandering in the wilderness to being able to move into the promised land. From the choices and the decisions that they made to possess God's promises, we can take those same lessons and see and apply them to our life. They're not just general words of encouragement for the Christian life. You know, I read this in this talking of thinking about this ancient story of conquest. It gives specific challenges for us as we work out God's salvation in our own lives. 
See, he gives us some ideas here on what and some examples on what we need to do to take possession of God's promises. The first thing that we see in what this is reading is we need to look to the future. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Bible says, The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready. Because you're going to cross the the river Jordan. You're going to go into the land and take possession of the land that I promised you. Moses is dead. Now, look, think about this. Here Joshua is. He served Israel, let's put it in our terms, like vice president for 40 years. He was accustomed to taking orders and then implementing the vision of someone else. There's no reason to think that Joshua had anything but real affection for Moses. But 40 years of history, and guess what? It's over. The partnership that worked so well for this long was over. Joshua, you know, personally, he could have just let himself be paralyzed by grief if he wanted to. He could have sentimentally had a longing to return back to a time when someone else was carrying the burden now for the people of God. But God shocks him into action with a a declaration. Moses is dead, now get ready. Which direction are you facing in life? Are you facing yesterday's? Are you facing tomorrow's? See, that's a key question for us if we want to truly possess the promises that God has given us. Yesterday can be a thing that can hold on to us more than we really need it to. Because sometimes we think about those wonderful memories. You can think about those times. When you start thinking about what happened 15, 20, 30 years ago. Because I'm telling you, sometimes I look at this world and I go, boy, I wish it was back more then than right now. Even 10 years ago. And the stuff that I'm seeing nowadays. But we look at these great victories that we had in our past. These pleasurable moments. And it, for some reason we want to turn around and try to relive them over and over and over again. Sometimes we look at the past with great regret. Terrible pain. And daily we're trying to fix those issues from then over and over. Both those victories and those defeats of yesterday, guess what? They're history. Yes, we can learn from it, but we are foolish to try to relive the past. You know, I love being a dad. Love it. There's not much in my life that compares to the joy of raising children. And as I've gotten older, I've realized even more the joy of sharing in their lives as they follow their own paths. Sometimes, though, I do grow a little nostalgic. I'll pull out a videotape of them when they were little, and I'm watching them run around and do things, and I'm hearing them say, Daddy, come on, let's go play. Some of those things can bring up some powerful emotions. But I would be a fool to try to recreate that time in my life because it's over. They'll never be six or 10 years old or 12 years old again. But you know, the great thing about this is that I love them now as adults because we get to adult, enjoy adult activities together. We're not having to sit there and wonder, oh, are they going to get themselves hurt over there? No, we're going out and being able to do things as adults together. In order to discover those joys of this stage in my life, I have to be able to be willing to let go of that past. Now, I do hope (laughs) to hear little voices call me again someday. (laughs) Come on. Well, I don't even know what word I'm going to use as a grandparent yet. But whatever it is, I'm hoping that they'll call me and say, come on, let's go play. Let's go play. I know I've got my family coming in, my dad and my sister and uh, her family and Everything else is coming in this, uh, this week, and we got little ones coming in, our great nieces 
And I know when they get with me, it's Uncle Darren, Uncle Darren, Uncle Darren. Let's go, let's go, let's go. They jump on me like I'm a mountain and just we have all kinds of fun. And that's going to be a great time. But that's something that you have to look forward to. Some of us are well into midlife or maybe even later life. And we're trying to still fix things from high school. Those cruel words that were hurled at us in a hallway have stuck to us. We spend so much energy trying to prove that we're not stupid or ugly or a dork or anything like that. And the strangest part of all that is that person who said that to you probably forgot about it the next day and have never thought about it for the next 20 years. Yet, what are we doing? Holding on to it, holding on to it. I hate to tell you, but yesterday's gone. We have a future, a hope of a future in our Lord. See, Jesus puts the necessity of facing the future in a word picture that makes it pretty clear. He says, let those who are spiritually dead care for their own dead. Your duty is to go on and preach the coming kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. We need to let go of the past in order to take hold of the future and the promises that God has given us. Now, the second thing that we need to do to possess the promises of God is define the promise. Joshua had a specific promise, a clear vision that was guiding his efforts. Cross into the land, march through it, take whatever I have given you. Every place your foot sets, it's yours. You know, it's amazing. This great leader never called for a vote or a retreat again. He knew what God's promise was, and he was determined to live in it. He had seen firsthand the result of being wishy-washy. He watched those people, those double-minded people, when they were, God is telling them to go here and to do this, and they're just like, oh, no, I don't want to, I don't think, maybe we should just go back to Egypt. Forty years. He was one of the 12 spies that went into Canaan to check out and get ready for the conquest. When he returned with Caleb, he had a beautiful glowing report. This place is great. But then the other people spoke up. You know, the yes, but kind of people. It's a great land, but. And they proceeded to magnify the problems of the land. They focused on the difficulties, even as they minimized God's promise. What did he say? It's yours. Has he ever given you a promise? Has he ever told you that something is yours and he's going to give it to you? Do you go back and go, well, you know, Lord, you said you're going to give me that, but look at all these other issues before I can even get there. Look at all this other stuff that could happen to me before I even get to that place. I'm sorry, but if he says it's going to happen and he promises it, guess what? It's yes and amen. It's a done deal. And whatever you have to do, you better do it. Well, you know what happened with the Israelite people. They wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. That whole generation died off, buried in the desert that they preferred over God's promises. I don't know about you, but I don't want to die in the desert. I want to make it to wherever he wants me to go. And whatever he wants me to do, whatever he's promised. So to possess the promise of God, we need to define and learn his will. And then we got to own it. It's ours. He promised it to me. You know, I was called into the ministry at the age of 12 in a youth camp when I gave my life to Christ. I can still remember where I was, the place I was kneeling, the whole thing. The problem is, is I didn't want it. I didn't want to go through what my parents, being in the ministry for so long, had to go through at times. The problem is, is I always thought of it as heartache, never really understanding the joys of ministry. 
At a young age, it's hard to understand some of the things that are going on. But despite the good times, despite the bad times, and all my decisions in my life, by the grace of God, he didn't give up on me. Finally, 28 years ago, I decided to accept the will and plan of God for my life. I accepted his call and his promise that he's going to take care of me no matter what comes up. See, the call of God became the priority choice of my life. You know, it's so much easier to say no to distractions if you've made a priority decision. Now, you may be asking, Pastor, how do we know what the will of God is? We know what he wants for us by incorporating some things that we can get from different areas of our life. And through the Holy Spirit, we can understand in our life as we're living for him what his will is. First, we need to have a solid working knowledge of the scripture, right? Who God is, how God works, his general will for people is all spelled out in his word. Are you a student of his word? Are you engaged regularly in studying the Bible beyond what we talk about right here on Sunday morning? Do you interact with the Bible in some way every single day of your life? Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it is judges the thought and the attitudes of our heart. That's what the word can do. So we can't fool it. It knows. God knows. And when we read this and we take it to heart, it's going to get through all of the junk that we have in us. And it's going to open us up and show us what we need to be doing for the Lord. Colossians 3 and 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, in all teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, God's word needs to be our daily bread. If it's not, you need to take a hard look at what you're doing. You need to look at what your priorities are and what priority decision you have made towards God. Is he that important to you to get to know him? Or is it just something you're trying to do so that you won't go to hell? You also have to live a life that includes prayer. See, prayer is, is, is simply conversing with God. It's, you know, I, I hear people tell me all the time, I really, Pastor, I really don't know how to pray. I like to ask them, do you know how to talk to people? You're talking to me, right? Right now? That's all you need to do is talk to God with your own words. It doesn't have to be some eloquent, loquacious thing that you're going on and on and thee and thou and all. No, just talk to God. Discuss the issues that you're having in your life. He already knows about it already, but just tell him. That's what he wants. Now, I know a mature prayer life is needed. That is what. But none of us are perfect from the first day we start to pray. None of us. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16 says, Rejoice always, what? Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's, what? Will. There's one part of yours, His will, right there. For you to rejoice, for you to pray, and to give thanks in everything to Him. If you say you don't know what God's will is, right there, I just told you. That's the first part. You start doing that right there, and you're going to see what else He has for you. Philippians 4 and 6 and 7 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, here it is again, present your request to God. And what? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. 
It is impossible to grow close to God, to know his will without talking to him daily. I'm sorry. Your spouse, if you didn't talk to that person daily, I wonder what would happen in that relationship. We all know what would happen. You're not growing closer, you're growing further apart. God just wants us to talk to him, to commune with him, to tell him how much we love him, to give him glory and honor in the things that we do and tell him, Lord, this is what I want to do for you, but I need you to tell me and guide me through whatever it is. If this is not what you want, tell me and I'll do something else. Whatever it is, Lord, whatever it is. So we have to have that prayer life. If you want to possess a promise from God, you got to know his will in that promise. We also need the counsel of wise, godly friends. This myth of the superhero doesn't apply to the Christian life. We are not all on our own. We are not having to do and fight everything by ourselves. I'm going to tell you something. I need you and you need me. We all need each other. See, God's will is sharpened as we share life with one another. Then we become authentic with one another. We talk through our fears. We talk through our doubts. We even talk through some of the arrogant assumptions that we have about ourselves or about other people. Godly friendships are priceless. They are a true blessing of God. We all need each other. We are truly blessed when we have godly friends in our lives. I mean, think about it. If they're truly godly friends, then they're going to have your best interest at heart. And you should have their best interest at heart if you are a true godly friend. You'll be there for encouragement, for fellowship. You will help each other grow. Proverbs 29 says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. Proverbs 27 and 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens another friend. We need each other. We cannot go. That's why they call it the family of God. It isn't the Darren of God. It isn't anybody else out here. It's not you. You're not alone. We're together in the kingdom of God, doing his will and his work. We also need circumstances in life in order for us to grow in the faith that we have in God. Now, I know you're probably going to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Pastor. I don't really like those circumstance things. I don't want them hardships and those difficulties to come up my way. I want it easy going. Well, Sorry. doesn't happen. The Bible says we're going to hit and be having trouble. It's just part of what life is. And then being a Christian, you're going to be targeted even more. But something you need to understand, in those circumstances, God is ruling the affairs of your life. He is perfectly capable of orchestrating situations so that he can create a place where his will and your life intersect. See, the things that we see in life, circumstances, sometimes we don't understand them, but God understands them. He knows what's going on with it. He knows exactly how to get you through it. Let me tell you something. You just can't ignore circumstances. You can't just say things are coming up against you and you just can't say, you know, I deny it. I'm not having it. I don't, nope, I can't. When you open your eyes, guess what? It's still there. If you do that, you're going to frustrate yourself in trying to pursue the plans that God has for you. If you keep saying, nope, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm trying to find what God wants for me, but I'm not going to deal with those things. Maybe God is doing that so you will deal, so you'll grow even more spiritually mature, so he can use you even more. Sometimes God's most firm no is that unyielding closed door that you just keep trying to open. 
And he's saying no. Sometimes God is protecting you from yourself. The bad decisions that we make. Now, I know probably there's some people who think you're perfect. Yep, I don't make bad decisions. What are you talking about? I got it all right here. Let me, some, let me ask you something. Have you ever had an appointment that you had to get to, and then something or someone comes up and makes you late? I don't know about you, but I really don't like being late. You get all upset at the circumstance or the person who created the circumstance. But then you realize as you're traveling the road to that appointment that a serious accident had occurred and that you would have been right in the middle of it if you would have been on time. See, God knows what's going on. We just need to accept that he is the one in charge. We need to trust him to guide us through the circumstances in our life. If you want to be able to reach and possess the promise he has, you got to trust him to get you through whatever it is to get there. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. He'll make your paths straight. He already knows all the paths and he knows how to get you to that promise. You just got to surrender yourself to him. You need to surrender your desires to him. In order to possess God's promises, it cannot be all about me. It has to be about him. If you have a surrendered heart that God's spirit has given a new life in, then you need to take a look at your desires and make sure, Lord, are these desires your desires? See, there's something that I think the world thinks and even some Christians get this in their mind. And they think, you know what? If I'm going to follow God's will, then I'm going ha- I mean, to have to be miserable. I mean, the world thinks that you're following, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this and that. All around, you have to be miserable following God. You know, there's some Christians that are even afraid to say, I love what I'm doing. They think somehow it's unspiritual to admit that life is good with God. I mean, did I not just talk about that? God is, I did on our, the podcast, the goodness of God. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. So then why wouldn't we have good in our life if he's in our life? We need to understand that when, we, when our life is fulfilled by Christ, it is good. Being at the center of God's will and his purpose is the most fulfilling place to be. He shaped you. He shaped me. He's prepared us with experiences. He's given us skills and abilities. And when we put all of that together and do what he wants us to do, Even in the exhaustion of battle, you can say, this is why I was created, for write this. I am content and I love what I'm doing for God. Psalms 20 and 4 says, may he grant your heart's desires and make your plans succeed. You know, it's not so much that he's going to say, okay, you just think about whatever you want to do and I'm going to grant it. No. It's when we get so close to him that our heart becomes his heart. Our desires become his desires, and he fulfills them, and we succeed in life because of him. Romans 8 and 28, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It was a pastor that recently wrote to a friend who was also a minister, and he said, you know what? These are the best days of my life. I think I've moved beyond the need to succeed, and I am more content in simply doing ministry for ministry's sake for the Lord. I love the fact that there's so much potential right in front of me to grow a multifaceted ministry, and I have all the resources to get it done. He went on to talk about his wife and how she now is able to go and teach what God has put on her life. 
How did they come to that place? It was by the grace of God. They made a priority choice to do God's will his way. And they made it known to him day by day. They wake up in the morning and say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? I want your promises. I want the things that I know you'll live, let me possess, but I need to do it your way. Tell me, Lord, what I need to do. See, when we do that, it allows us to enjoy the rewards of a beautifully blessed life. I don't know about you, but I'm blessed by God. Every day, I'm blessed by God. Hebrews 10 and 36 says, Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. See, when we're doing God's will, there's no better place to be to possess his promises than we are when we are in his will. When we're doing his work. But in order to do that, we need to stay in his presence. His powerful presence. Verse 5 says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you and I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise. That's not just to Joshua. That's not just to the Israeli people. It is for everyone who is a child of God. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the path of light in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We just got to make the decision and the choice to live in his presence. That takes obedience to his will. That takes obedience to his commands. Obedience is fundamental if you want to enjoy the presence of God. See, because if you're openly rebellious against God, the Holy Spirit will withdraw his comfort from you. How can he stay and be in there if you're not going to live for him? It isn't just a free thing and go, oh, I don't care what I get do and what I do in life. I can go out and do anything else. God's still going to bless me and do all. No, that's not what he said. It's contingent on us living our life for him. Going to heaven, being saved is not contingent on anything that we do. But the blessings that he gives us here, the promises that he gives us here, and the promise of eternal life is on us living for our Lord. If you re resist the conviction of the word, you will grow distant from God's presence. If he's telling you you shouldn't be doing that, you're looking in his word and his word is telling you that's not good for you, don't do it, don't do it, and you just keep on doing it. If you nurture ungodly attitudes like pride, unforgiveness, greed, sensuality, all those things, God's spirit cannot be near you. See, God encouraged Joshua, be strong and courageous. What he was about to do was going to take every bit of strength he had and more. But Joshua needed to understand that he couldn't do it on his own. It isn't by his skill. This was all going to be because he was in God's powerful presence. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Basically, that's telling us don't wander. Don't, don't just go off on your own little tangent. Stay in God's presence. Stay following his will, his commands. It's so easy for us to wander off when our attention gets drawn off from other things in life. And it pulls us onto a path of destruction. Temptation loves to seduce us with a sweet song. 
Decorations of life captivate our eyes, and, and we start thinking in our minds, well, I, I can't live without it. i got to have that. We easily grow envious of the position of someone else and thinking, if I had what they have, then I would have a happy and joyous life. But Psalms 119 says, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's his word that's going to keep us from wandering off. The peace that we get found in the presence of God helps us stay where we're supposed to stay. It produces a serenity that allows us to rise above the, all the other issues that cause others to panic, cause others to be filled with fear and to fall apart. I'm sure that everybody in here probably could admit that they've allowed many things in life, sometimes circumstances, st to steal God's peaceful presence from them and thus his power from them. When we attempt to exert control over our own situations, when we try to impose a, a piece of our own design, guess what happens? <laughs> things get worse. I don't know you, but I, I, I can attest to that personally. I don't know about you, but if, have you ever been in the middle of a stressful day? Have you ever just exploded, which then added other stress to you and others? You just kind of lost it? In the middle of that crisis, you tried to force a solution, and you created more chaos with your own effort. But let me tell you something. If you will take a moment... Stop whatever you're doing. Recenter yourself in the Holy Spirit. Ask him to come into your mind. Ask him to come into your heart right there. And I'm going to tell you something. Peace will follow. Now, the situation may stay exactly the same. But guess what? You are changed. The situation still can be something difficult. But you have changed because now you're in the presence of the Lord. And his peace is in your heart. Now I want you to understand something. I don't want you to misunderstand what God desires for you. God was not inviting Joshua to a nice retirement community on the Mediterranean Sea. He wasn't offering Joshua a rocking chair. He was handing him a commission in his army. A challenge to possess the promised land and to build a new nation. See, God's will is not for you to detach yourself from reality, to run away from life and try to deny all of the things going on. He wants you to be fully engaged in life, bring order to chaos, heal to the, healing to the broken, resisting evil wherever it makes its ugly appearance. But do it all in the spiritual warfare of this Christian life. He wants us to be people who live in his beautiful, powerful, peaceful presence. So do you want to possess God's promises? We have to embrace Christ as our Lord and Savior by faith. That's the entry point of grace. Then we have our part. We look to the future. We define the purpose and promise of God. And then we stay obedient and let him lead us in his powerful presence to that promise. As I said before, God's promises are yes and amen. If he says it, you can bank on it. We don't have to worry about him not being able to fulfill his promises. We just need to live the holy life for him so that we can possess his promises and his blessings. That's what it takes. I want you all to stand with me, please. Now, I know you may look at me and say, Pastor, I don't have any promises from God. Well, now, I'm going to tell you to go back to the Word because He's given a whole lot of promises in His Word for you. It may not be what you are thinking of as a promise for this life, but he has given you a lot of promises. 
and he's willing and ready to fulfill them if you'll just take a hold. The greatest promise is eternal life with him forever. But you've got to accept him and live for him. I want everybody to bow your heads today. I just want you to think about what God has promised you. If you're having a hard time thinking about something specific, start thinking about the word and the things that he's promised. Never to leave you or forsake you. To love, his love is ever enduring. To be there to take you through the circumstances. He may not make them go away, but he's going to take you through them. He provides a way to get through. Those are promises that you can live by. He promises that he will never, <clears throat> never waver. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're the wavering part. He's the rock that we can stand on. He's the tower that we can run to when we need refuge. He's the strength that we can have in every situation. He's the peace and the comfort. He's the encouragement. He's the redeeming factor in our life. He is our salvation. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right there's a promise. So I just want you right now to just think on the promises that God has made you. Maybe it's something specific he gave you a dream about or a vision about. And you're kind of wondering, how do I get to that point? Well, I've told you today, but the main thing is to stay in his presence. Continually praying, continually in his word, in his beautiful presence, and he will show you and give you the promise. Yes, it may be some work. Yes, it may take a little maturing in your life. It may mean that you've got to go through some circumstances. But he'll take you through. Lord, I'm asking you to touch every one of us here today. We're your children. We're yours. I'm asking you to help us to stay firm in your presence. As we walk daily in this journey, we're not taking one step away from you. We're not going to the right or to the left. We're staying straight on the path that you have before us so that we can possess the promises that you've given and said that we're going to have. Not looking in the back, but looking forward to you. Right now, Lord. Strengthen us to have the resolve to press on towards the goal to win the prize in which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Right now, Lord, let us possess and take possession of what you've promised. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to not walk out of here with the same attitude, with the same thought, but let us be firm in knowing and making a priority choice that we're living for you from now on for everything, in everything. Thank you, Jesus, that you're so willing to show us the way. You're so willing to give the things that you've promised to us. That you're willing, Lord, to guide and direct us and strengthen us and Walk with us as we go through this life. Thank you, Jesus. Let the words of our mouth, let the meditations of our heart, Lord. This is everything, Lord. Let it be acceptable in your sight. Because you're our Redeemer, you're our Savior, you're our all in all. Help us, Lord, right now to live in that promise. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. 
How many are going to walk out of here and say, I'm going to go possess? In fact, I want you to say it. I'm going to possess the promises of God. I'm going to live in the promises of God. Amen? I hope you all have a great and blessed week. Remember, we have lunch directly afterwards. I need all of the, the pastor's counsel to stay right up here, please. You know who you are. If you could just stay right up here, we will join them in just a little bit. If everyone would bow your heads, I'll go ahead and pray for the food and then just follow the directions of those back there that are getting everything prepared. Lord, we thank you for a beautiful presence today and all that you're doing. And now we're asking you to continue to be with us in this fellowship time. Lord, as we share with one another the things in our life and we, we let, let it help us to grow together so that we can encourage one another, we can lift each other up, and that we can live as a family of God. And we thank you for this and providing all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. I'll see you on back there. Have a blessed week.